uh, thanks for coming to another um, session of the UCL Dark Invited Speaker Series. Today we're hearing from, from Eric Riemanns, um, who's going to give a talk about training virtual robots in realistic simulations and the emergence of intelligent behavior in, in that setting. Um, uh, Eric's a PhD student at Georgia Institute of Technology, advised by Irfan Esser and Dhruv Batra. Um, his work is primarily focused on computer vision um, and its applications to, to AI, of course, with a long-term research goal of developing fundamental techniques, algorithms, and large-scale systems for robotic assistance. Um, he's been very involved in the AI Habitat platform and uh, embodied AI in general, and has been a lead organizer for two embodied AI workshops at CVPR. Uh, yeah, really looking forward to the presentation, Eric. Over to you. Yeah. All right. So, as was said in the introduction, today we'll be mostly talking about this transition in the AI community from uh, Internet AI, where you're learning something about the world from a large corpus of static images, to embodied AI, where you have an agent that now has to interact with the world deal with the consequences of its own actions, deal with the caveats of egocentric perception, such as partial observability, not perfectly framed, motion blur, et cetera. And a lot of the rationale behind this line of research is based on this idea called the embodiment hypothesis. The embodiment hypothesis is the idea that intelligence emerges in the interaction of an agent with an environment and as a result of sensor motor activity. And we'll be talking about the embodiment hypothesis kind of in the context of the scaling hypothesis, where the scaling hypothesis loosely is that the algorithms for intelligence exist. We have kind of the fundamental tools to create intelligent systems, and we're missing the scale. We're missing scale in terms of problem complexity, in terms of number of samples, in terms of number of parameters, et cetera. But really, there's you can get a long way with intelligence from scaling uh, the amount of experience and problem complexity. I'll be talking about mostly these two works, and then at the end, I'll touch on some new works and some ongoing works. The first is DDPPO, which we presented at iClear last year, and then the other one is work under review at PNAS currently. So I'll talk first about the DDPPO work. This is with uh, these group of folks from Facebook, Georgia Tech, Simon Fraser University, and Oregon State. So we'll be talking about a task called point goal navigation, and we'll be using the AI Habitat platform, which is a simulator that we as a group work on and is open source and quite nice and fast. And so in the task of point goal navigation, you have an agent that's initialized at a random location in the environment and is tasked with navigating to a point specified as a relative coordinate and it must do so with only egocentric observations, a depth camera, a RGB camera, and a GPS plus compass sensor that it uses to constantly update to the position of the goal to be relative to its current location. Note that the top-down map here is shown solely for visualization purposes. The agent does not have access to this map. And so a completed episode would look something like this. And so this problem is pretty simple if you do have the map. It's a undergrad computer science assignment of finding the shortest path on a known map. However, as soon as you don't have the map anymore, it's a much more challenging problem and the algorithms for it don't really exist and are an active research question. And so we'll be looking at the question of what is the fundamental limit of learnability for this task? Is the task completely learnable with generic components? In other words, only on policy reinforcement learning with a generic neural network. So to look at this question, I'll introduce the agent in model design. We have our little agent here. At every time step, it receives egocentric observations, in this case, just an RGB image. It receives the updated position of the goal. We'll do kind of normal computer vision stuff of stick the image through a CNN, and then we'll combine multiple observations throughout the course of time through a policy parameterized by an LSTM. The policy at every time step will predict an action, and it'll also predict an estimate of the value function. That's something used for learning. And this will be strung together throughout the course of time. This was done a few years ago now, and so 
this was done a year ago now, how fast the field changes. If this was done now, this would probably be a transform instead of LSTM. But the general idea here still applies where you're stringing together multiple observations throughout the course of time. And so we're going to attack this with large scale training via a reinforcement learning algorithm called proximal policy optimization. Doesn't really matter what exactly that is. The general idea is that the agent is going to interact with the environment and learn from those interactions. It'll get a reward signal when it does something that's good, and it'll get a negative reward signal when it does something that's bad. String those together and you can get a policy with enough experience. And this has minimal assumptions. And the downside of the minimal assumption is that it requires large scale training. You're going to need a lot of experience to make up for the fact that you're not assuming many things. So let's look at existing methods for large scale RL. We have this problem, we have this setup, and now we need a large scale RL method that's suitable for it. However, existing methods for large scale RL are designed around a different set of criteria. They're designed for something like playing Atari. And because of that, they make some fundamental assumptions. They assume that simulation is cheap. It can be done quickly on a single CPU core and that you have relatively small neural networks. Tasks like Atari aren't very visually complex. You don't need a large neural network to deal with that visual complexity. Or even in some cases, you do things based on state where you have a very low dimensional observation. So you can use a small neural network. However, in the situation like Habitat, these assumptions don't apply anymore. You have uh, now complex simulation that virtually demands GPU acceleration. And because observations are, are more complex, they're egocentric observations, you now need a much larger neural network. So to meet the constraints of these assumptions, we introduced a new reinforcement uh, a new large scale reinforcement learning technique called decentralized distributed PPO. In DDPPO, each uh, GPU runs its own copies of the simulator throughout the course of time. Then, after collecting experience, they all individually compute gradients. These gradients are combined via an all reduce operation to then update the parameters. And so, it, thus keeping all of the weights of all of the different policies across all the GPUs all in sync because they're all being updated with the exact same update. And so this method is distributed. It runs on many GPUs, potentially across many different nodes, and it's decentralized. There's no centralized parameter server to act as a bottleneck. And then there's this all reduce operation. And this is a quite useful operation to use here as uh, all reduce is also what is used to reduce gradients in distributed data parallel training and supervised learning. And so there's a lot of work and a lot of research that goes into making this all reduce operation as quick as possible, trying to hide all of the latency and overhead with it. And so this is a very well optimized operation that runs very quickly due to all of the work that's put into it due to its use in supervised learning. And so now we'll look at how well DDPPO scales. So the ideal scaling is to have a simple x equals y line. So you have perfect scaling where you add another GPU and you get that much more performance out of it. If we do a naive version of this idea of synchronizing everything together with all reduce, you'll get the red line here. And then DDPPO has a method to deal with something called stragglers. Stragglers are different GPUs that are going to be running at slightly different speeds due to things like kernel scheduling, driver scheduling, and also just the environment that they're simulating at its core can be quite different. And so that'll take longer or shorter depending on the complexity of the environment. And But with the method that we propose for dealing with these stragglers, which we call straggler preemption, where you simply cut off the amount of experience, you cut short that amount of experience if, a, if something's running slow, you get this quite good scaling. You get a 196x speed up across 256 GPUs. And so this gives you quite an amount of scale. If, if one GPU is running at 100 steps per second, you can then hit 20,000 steps per second. So now we'll look at the performance of point-call navigation trained to quite a large scale with this type of system. 
So using DDPPO, we trained a policy for 2.5 billion steps of experience on point cloud navigation, over, which is over 180 days of GPU time in just under three days of wall clock time. So you can see that the performance here, keep in mind that this is performance on a held out validation set. These are scenes that have never been seen before. And so the agent is navigating in a unknown environment with perfect success. And that is due to the scale of training. This is um, over an order of magnitude more experience that was than was previously looked at. And you can see by this graph that that additional order of magnitude is what lets you go from pretty good performance to near perfect performance. And so despite this very high performance, we do see some interesting behavior in the agents. Uh, particularly, it's very good at backtracking which is somewhat surprising given that on the training set, at least it takes the optimal shortest path every time. And so it's interesting that it knows how to backtrack despite not doing that pretty much ever on the training set. So this is an example of a validation environment where the agent nicely backtracks, where it misses the turn into the bedroom to get to the goal. It notices that and then backtracks to get to the goal. And so in this work, we looked at the question of is point call navigation entirely learnable and answered it affirmatively with an existence proof. And really the only task specific assumption that we made here is a shaped reward. There's a reward shaping based on the change in uh, geodesic distance to target, which is quite similar to what you use if you were doing this in a like classical mapping and planning setup, you'd use like something like the fast marching method to estimate the geodesic distance and use that to plan on top of. And so that reward is quite similar in that regard, but nothing else is really specific to the task. It's generic on policy reinforcement learning, a generic RNN, a generic CNN, but you still get very strong performance thanks to large scale training. So now we're going to look a little bit more into these navigation agents and what exactly they're looking at. This is work with, again, a similar group of folks. And in this work, we're looking at these agents through the context of animal navigation. So there's been decades of research into how animals nav navigate. And that research posits that organisms build and maintain spatial representations of their environments or, or maps in their brain. There's evidence that ants do this. There's evidence that bats do this, even blind mole rats. So animals that are actually blind or animals that are situationally blind due to darkness maintain maps and chimpanzees. This chimpanzee experiment in particular is quite foundational and quite interesting. Uh, so the way that this chimpanzee experiment works and the reason why there's a strong hypothesis that chimpanzees have some spatial representation of their environment is due to this idea called shortcuts. So what this diagram is showing here is um, all of the nodes indicate areas of food. So all of the numbers with a circle is somewhere where there's food and all of the numbers on those circles are the order that a caretaker of the chimpanzee visited those locations. So the caretaker picked up the chimpanzee, started at the S, which is start, walk to one, walk to two, walk to three, four, five, so on and so forth. Then after showing the chimpanzee all of these locations, the chimpanzee was put back at the start location and released into the environment to find the food by itself. And then the line here is the path the chimpanzee actually took. And so you can see that the chimpanzee is taking a very different route than what it was shown. It's, it's cutting out like weird trips that the caretaker took and it's overall traversing faster than previously was done. And so this really indicates that the chimpanzee spatially understands its environment. It knows where those locations are with their spatial relationship to each other. And so it's able to take different paths that are referred to as shortcuts, which are path, which are shorter paths between two nodes than have been previously traversed. So they're shorter paths through free space and through uh, free space of the environment, previously untraversed free space. 
So in this work, we're going to look at the question of do artificial intelligence agents learn to build maps of their environment as a natural consequence of learning to navigate? So a positive answer to this question would shed light onto the internal workings of black box AI navigation agents. So these navigation agents from the DPPO paper, we don't know how they work. We don't really know what's going on inside of them. We can just look and see, okay, it does well on navigation. This would give you some idea of what it's doing internally. It's possibly building some map-like representation of the environment and then using that for navigation. And in a similar manner to convergent evolution, which is this beautiful idea and beautiful observation in the kind of natural history of evolution, where you see the same mechanism um, evolving and coming into play for, in many animals with no common ancestor with that trait. It's like a classic example of this is flight, where birds and bats don't have a common flying ancestor, but they both fly with very different mechanisms. And that implies that flight uh, is a natural solution to uh, the pressures of the environment. It fulfills some niche in the environment. So in a similar way here, we'd see that maps are perhaps a natural solution to navigation, where we're seeing maps in a agent that is quite generic and doesn't make any assumptions. If maps emerge, that, that perhaps implies that they're a natural solution to navigation. So we're again going to look at this in the context of point cloud navigation, however, with a slightly different sensor suite on the agent this time. Specifically, we're going to look at blind navigation agents. We're going to take away their depth sensor and their RGB camera and give them only access to this position sensor. Uh, this allows us to kind of get rid of a whole bunch of different possible confounding variables for mapping where you're doing something where you're, where you're relocalizing based on previously known waypoints, and also it gives you a very harsh environment for it, where you're trying to navigate just based on solely what your position is in an unknown environment. And one nice thing about using a generic agent here is that designing a architecture for this type of blind navigation agent is quite simple. We just chop out the CNN and the input to it. And so the first question to ask here is, OK, is efficient navigation with only this ego motion sensing possible? And we do find it is. So this plot, again, shows training out to this time 1.5 billion steps of experience. And you see that the blind agent, in terms of success, recovers almost all of the performance of its sighted counterpart. It's somewhere in the 96, 97 range, while the sighted ones are in the 99.9 .9 range. However, it's much less efficient. It tends to take very wandering paths in the environment. And so this is an example of one of these blind agents navigating. So you can see that it spends quite some time bumping around. And while quite inefficient, this blind agent will eventually make it to the goal. It, it's, it's quite good at kind of exhaustively exploring its environment and then getting to the goal. And so these things are, are, are while they're not as efficient as sighted agents, they're actually quite good navigation agents given only this ego motion sensing. One kind of classical example, one kind of classical algorithm for the for this type of sensing and this type of navigation is a bug algorithm. And those are algorithms uh, on this diagram here that basically follow walls and use that to make it to the goal. And so these bug algorithms do have 100% success. They will always make it given an infinite step budget. However, these blind navigation agents are much more efficient. So they achieve 63% SPL, which is basically a 63% path path efficiency, while bug algorithms are somewhere in the 40%. And this is even for what we call a clairvoyant bug algorithm that 
is given whether or not at a wall it should wall follow left or wall follow right. Then the other one interesting thing here is this wall following behavior. And so this windy path here. This wall following behavior it, it is an emergent property. It's something that the agent learns to do. And it's somewhat counterintuitive because this is not the, the optimal policy. And it, or at least it's not the optimal policy if you knew the environment. And so this policy emerges because the environments are unknown. The agent doesn't know which environment it, it's in. And this is functionally true even in the training set, because while the agent in theory could learn to memorize and identify all the environments, it's not functionally possible. And so, and that's largely due to the fact that the coordinate system is episodic. The, it, when the agent is initialized in the environment, that point is zero, zero. And so it becomes very difficult for the agent to figure out, even in the training set, which environment it's in and where it is in that environment. And so this wall fall in behavior is, it, it emerges due to the fact that the agent is learning a policy for navigation in unknown environments. If the environment is known and you give the agent global coordinates, then it perfectly recovers the shortest path in the environment. It'll, it just memorizes all of the different paths between all of the different goal points and gets a success of 100% with perfect path efficiency. So given, given this and given the performance of the agent, we next start looking at why performance is this high. And so the big thing that we find is that memory, the agent's memory is key to its performance. So this is a plot showing the performance in SPL, which again is path efficiency. All of the success is quite high, high here. So it's reasonable to treat that as just path efficiency. And so as we increase the effective memory length of the agent over time, we see that performance monotonically improves and doesn't saturate until the agent has a memory capable of incorporating over a thousand steps of information into it. And then what this memory is used for is mapping. So to show this, we perform a AI rendition of Menzel's chimpanzee experiment. Specifically, what we do is we initialize a agent in an environment at a start location. And then it goes about and does its thing, bumps into walls, slowly meanders around, and eventually finds its way to the goal. Once the agent find its, finds its way to the goal, we reinitialize a second agent in the environment. This second agent is given the final hidden state of the first agents uh, from the first agent. So we'll refer to this as the agent which does the navigation and then a probe, which is the secondary agent that's given the hidden state. Note that the probe doesn't influence the agent at all. The agent is trained without knowledge of the probe and um, does get rewards from it. The probe is trained solely as a auxiliary device later on to analyze what's in the agent's hidden state. So the probe is initialized in the environment. It's given this hidden state. And then with the hidden state, it then is able to take shortcuts. It's able to cut out, uh, it's able to take the hypotenuse here of this triangle that the agent took instead. And it's also able to remove entire excursions where the agent went into this office here, wandered around for a bit and came out. The, the probe is capable of removing that entirely. And so it overall takes a much more efficient path indicating that the agent has stored spatial information in the hidden state. There's, there's map-like information in the hidden state that enables the probe to take these types of shortcuts and overall have a much more efficient path. Uh, so quantitatively, we look at this in terms of two different task types. So what I just showed is what we refer to as uh, second nav s to t, second nav start to target. And then we also check to make sure that there's not any inherent biases in this task and flip it around so that we do target to source also. And in both cases, giving the probe access to the trained agent memory dramatically increases the, the SPL 
Um, just for context here, this bump in SPL recovers almost all of the performance of if you'd given the agent an RGB camera. Agents with RGB cameras get somewhere around 90% SPL. And so the, this blind probe is getting 85% SPL and that bump in performance is large, is entirely due to this additional information that's been collected about the environment and stored in the agent's hidden state. And so this is something, this is what this looks like. This is a example of this, of the target to source probe variety. So the agent has made it to the target location. And now we initialize a probe with the agent's final hidden representation. And then the probe navigates back much more efficiently. So you can see on this, like this is a very qualitatively different path. The, the probe is not bumping around. It's not slamming into walls in the same way. It much more knows where it's going and is able to take a very efficient path because of that. The other thing that we do is we decode a, a metric map from the agent's hidden state. So the, the goal here is given the agent's hidden state at the end of an episode, decode a map from it. So we again take this hidden state and train a decoder that goes from hidden state to top-down map. And that's trained on the train set, validated on an unseen validation set. The, the validation set is both unseen to the probe and, sorry, to the agent and the decoder. And these are the types of predictions that we get from it. And so this is a distribution of predictions where A is a quite bad prediction, D is a very good one, C and B are about in the mean. And so these, while these aren't perfect, you get a surprisingly good prediction out of, out of the decoder. And you can also see that the decoder is able to pick up on uh, regularities in the environment where these are indoor houses. So you have um, things like hallways. And so if, uh, if there's reason from the agent sentence state, if the agent believes that there's a wall on one side of the environment, it's easy to infer that there's probably a parallel wall with it, given uh, priors about the environment. So uh, quantitatively, this is a distribution plot of the IOU between the uh, prediction from the decoder and the ground truth. And we look at, we're comparing two things here. So the trained embedding comes from a trained agent. And then we also compare that against a random embedding. And the random embedding is generated by taking the same architecture as the agent, but it, uh, resetting it to be random weights, and then taking the observations that the agent took and passing it through this random LSTM. Uh, random LSTMs have been shown to be pretty good sequence encoders, uh, all things considered. And so this is a somewhat fairly strong baseline and so the the training, not the navigation training, not the LSTM itself, is is what's responsible for this ability to predict maps. Finally, we show that this memory is task dependent. At the end of the day, this is still an LSTM that has a limited memory capacity. And so, what does it remember? What does it forget? What we show that it forgets is excursions. So we define an excursion as whenever the agent kind of goes out and then comes back to a similar point. And we then train a, again, a decoder network to predict the chance that the, to predict whether or not the agent has visited a specific location in the past, given the hidden state. And so we can look to see, does the agent remember where it's been? And the agent is very good at remembering where it's been for non-excursion locations. And we have some quantitative numbers in the paper and then this qualitative figure showing that you have much lighter blue, almost 0% visitation chance along this red excursion, while you have very high visitation chance along the black main path. So tying this back in with the embodiment hypothesis, I think that this is beginning to show that the embodiment hypothesis has a good chance of being correct. These are reasonably intelligent behaviors. You have things like wall following, backtracking, map building that are emergent properties of 
interaction with an environment. These are agents that are bumping around and navigating in the environment and you're getting intelligent behaviors out of them. It's so kind of the summary of these two things, of these two works put together is that we're showing that point goal navigation is learnable and that there's evidence that machines build maps. And so uh, from here, I'll transition to talking about some kind of current ongoing work about speeding up simulation. But if anybody has questions about these two works, I'm happy to take those now. Um. I mean, I think we also have time at the end for 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 questions. But um, I guess one thing that um, I'm wondering is, um, like, I guess I guess there's a simulation gap, right? I mean, in terms of, or better said, a reality gap, right? I mean, ultimately, I understand. I guess you do these things in these kind of three D kind of photorealistic simulated environments, such that eventually, I would say, right, we can take maybe um something like we've done there and applied to like robots in the real world right otherwise we could i guess investigate many of the research questions here also in in, in grid worlds which i guess there's this kind of ongoing debate whether like grid worlds are great to do research or like whether we should be doing research in these um in these 3d simulated environments but i was just running like for example the uh the the things we, you were just talking about i mean couldn't we have investigated the same things in in grid worlds um or is there something about these kind of 3d simulations that really allow us to get like new insights, right? Or, or different insights that we couldn't get from kind of more simplified environments. I think uh, for the for the case of blind agents, yeah, grid world would likely also be a good place to do this. You, you have the benefit of kind of it, with these three simulations, you have the benefit of extracting your your maps from the grid world based on the real world. And so you have some of the kind of realistic priors that that happen in the real world baked into that. And I think that that's part of it, where if this was truly a random environment, like truly a random maze, I haven't tested this, but I'm not as convinced that you'd get mapping here just because it's it's such a more complex space. I think some of the, the underlying structure of the environment is what lets it learn mapping. So I think that that's part of the benefit of 3D simulation is you get this injection of realistic type priors. And then there's the, the whole addition of vision, which I do think is, is quite an important component. We took out vision from this in, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, it, you don't get the same type of behavior from the agent. I think that vision for at least the navigation problems at the scale of these Gibson and Matterport houses kind of lets the agent shortcut a lot of, it, it lets it short circuit a lot of the performance. You don't really need as much memory to do it. But I do think you'd get in a much larger type of, type of environment, even with vision, you'd start getting these types of map building structures. We have taken vision agents and tried to decode maps from them and that fails. We can't we can't decode convincingly better than baseline maps from the hidden state of agents with vision. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so and I'll start talking about some kind of ongoing work, and this is focused mainly on really speeding up uh, complex simulation. And so this is so ongoing work that I'm calling, for now at least, a variable experience rate reinforcement learning. And so as a group, one thing that we've done recently is released Habitat 2.0. And this is kind of our next generation of, of Habitat. This includes a lot more physics interaction. And so this allows you to do tasks where you have an agent that's rearranging the environment. It's opening fridges and taking objects out and putting them on the counter, etc. And while the simulator itself is quite fast, the the training with it is a little bit slower than it could be and should be and so kind of the core issue here is that a common way to get more parallelism more performance out of a simulator is to stack a whole bunch of environments and separate processes however none of these environments really run at the same speed so you'll get different amounts of time to for them to all complete their simulation step and give you the next observations then in a reinforcement learning type paradigm, you take that, send it through inference to predict new actions, 
and you'd send actions back out. And again, you have this issue of there's some environments are slower than the others. And then this process continues throughout and throughout until you get to learning. And so kind of the problem here is, is all of this white space in this diagram, all the white space on the horizontal axis, that's all wasted time where you're sitting around waiting for one slow thing to finish. And so there, there are some existing solutions to this problem in the literature. One quite interesting solution is this paper called High Throughput Synchronous Reinforcement Learning uh, from Lou et al. published in NERVS 2020. So the idea there is to use a very similar uh, sampling procedure as asynchronous reinforcement learning does, but in a synchronous setting. And so instead of trying to synchronize all of the environments and predicting actions for all of them at once, you only do that for smaller subsets. So you'll get a diagram that looks something like this, where the fast environments, the two fast ones are basically being synced together and then you do inference and, and so on. And then that this continues on to the course of learning where you'll synchronize everything and you still need to collect a fixed number of steps from each environment and then do learning. And so what this handles well is step level variability. You can see on the left-hand side of this that you have a much closer stack of inference and experience than on the right hand side. It doesn't handle this type of episodic level variability where you have some episodes where you have consistently longer to simulate step times. And this, this happens in, in reality due to environments. This happens in practice due to environments with different complexities. So a large multi-room house just takes longer to simulate than a small one bedroom apartment. One other solution to this is asynchronous reinforcement learning, where you are just continuously collecting experience, continuously learning, and these things don't really have any uh, synchronization interplay with them. And so it handles both of these well, but asynchronous reinforcement is generally less sample efficient due to the lack of synchronized coordination. You have experience that's been collected with an old version of the policy. It also requires overlapping learning and experience collection. And this is generally actually a good thing in the situation where you can do simulation mostly on the CPU. It, it's a good thing to overlap learning and experience collection. However, GPU uh, driven environments, it's not that great to overlap these things anymore for, for two reasons. One, uh, GPU driven environments, generally the reason why we're using it Generally, the reason why we're using GPU in the first place is because we have high dimensional observations that are rendered. These high dimensional observations then result uh, easily create a lot of work for the GPU. So a like big 256 by 256 image gives the GPU a huge amount of work to do by itself. And so you don't, you don't need a huge number of images. And also because these give the GPU a lot of work, it's very easy for the learning process itself to completely max out the GPU. In, in this world of reinforcement learning with high dimensional observations, a, a pretty well implemented learning process can get to nearly 100% GPU utilization on its own. And so adding in more things on top of that actually reduces the amount of performance you can get out of the GPU because as soon as you have many processes, and you're exceeding 100% utilization, the driver now has to swap some processes out and bring some others in and all of that adds overhead and costs. And so this is a downside of async RL. And then the other thing is that it's, it's designed for a different criteria. They are systems that are designed to have hundreds if not thousands of environments all feeding a single GPU. And the ability to support hundreds to thousands of environments adds, adds overheads. Those overheads get masked and amortized out due to that number of environments. But in a situation like Habitat, you can really only get 16, maybe 32 environments to fit on a single GPU at best. And that's not high enough to amortize out those fixed costs. And so if you instead build something that really only can scale to that size, you can get more performance by not having those overheads due to scaling. The core idea that I've been playing around with is 
uh, what I call ragged rollouts. So normally in synchronous reinforcement learning, you have a rollout that contains k steps of experience from n environments. And the idea here is to collect a variable amount of experience from different environments, no longer fixing the amount of steps that you'll you'll collect. So you'll collect more experience from fast environments and less from slow ones. So that looks on this diagram from before. Uh, it, uh, with also the ideas of high th throughput synchronous reinforcement learning played in is you take out the two slowest steps and do some more steps from the fastest environments. And so this gives you overall higher throughput and higher performance with the downside of now having some bias in, in your gradient estimate because you're no longer sampling uniformly from all the environments. However, I will note that this is something that asynchronous reinforcement learning does implicitly. Asynchronous reinforcement learning by its nature collects different amounts of experience per environment. And then the other idea that I've been playing around with is uh, preempting stragglers on a per environment level. And so in this, you just simply get rid of these two last steps. When to preempt with this is a little bit of a tricky question. And the way that I've been uh, experimenting with doing that and what seems to work well in practice is you look at the last rollout and then ask the question, when should it have been preempted for the maximum number of steps per second? And that gives you a, and then you use that for the next one. And that isn't perfect, but it tends to work quite well in practice. So these are little performance numbers that I have currently for this, just to give you guys an idea of, of where this is going. And I think this works quite well. So uh, this is on the rearrangement tasks in Habitat 2.0. You have an agent that's trying to pick something up out of the fridge with a decently small neural network and comparisons to standard PPO sample factory, which is the fastest. Oh, it looks like not all of my changes to the acronym say I've done this. So VSF and VER are the same thing, just I changed the acronym for it recently. So sample factory is a very high performance uh, asynchronous reinforcement learning library. And then we have the different variants of my proposed thing. And so this is this ends up being slightly faster than asynchronous reinforcement learning in a domain that's pretty amenable to it, where you have a small neural network. As soon as we start talking about larger, larger neural networks, I think that this will end up doing better. But I haven't uh, tried that out just yet. Then the other thing that I quickly wanted to touch on is kind of where I see uh, high throughput reinforcement learning systems going in the future. And so this is kind of a proof of concept work that we presented at iClear this year. And so as we've been talking about, simulating only one environment underutilizes modern GPUs. We have this standard solution of duplicating the simulator multiple times and feeding those into batch policy inference and learning. What goes on inside of this box could be a whole variety of things from the ideas that I'm currently playing around with, asynchronous reinforcement learning, standard synchronous reinforcement learning, et cetera. But all of these ideas have some inherent downsides to them. You can't share large 3D assets in GPU memory. If you have a scene that takes up a gigabyte of GPU memory, if you want another simulator, you need another gigabyte of GPU memory. There's also synchronization overheads that increase with the number of environments. So this leads to a problem that the available parallelism is just limited because you, you can't scale out your parallelism infinitely because you'll either run out of GPU memory or your, your synchronization overheads scale linearly if at best. And so eventually you'll be dominated by those. In this work, we show that by getting rid of those, by dealing with these issues, you can get 100x improvement over the point cloud navigation training that we did in the DDPPO paper. And the core idea here is around batched simulation. So we rethink environments and rendering in terms of, of batches, where now, instead of a simulator instance simulating one agent, it simulates a batch of them. The simulator itself takes in a batch of n actions and produces a batch of n states. Internally, this has a bunch of threads, and so it extracts parallelism itself by using a thread pool. 
And then this is given to a batched renderer. The batched renderer has N 3D environments running on it. And these all reference some number of scenes K that's much less than the N number of environments, which lets you have many more environments than you do scene assets. And you can share the memory of these scene assets between all the environments. And then these end states and end frames are passed back to learning and inference to do the normal learning and inference. So we use synchronous reinforcement learning here. And so this is a output of what the batched renderer looks like. So this is end environments all being rendered and simulated in a single GPU request. And that lets you amortize a whole bunch of overheads. And so batch rendering makes new optimizations possible. You can share 3D assets. Multiple assets uh, can be interchanged without reconfiguration. And also there are a bunch of low level optimizations that you can make on the renderer side to, um, to amortize the cost of a bunch of fixed overheads in there. And so with the exact same neural network, with a big ResNet 50 neural network, this system is about a 10x improvement. But over 90% of that time is spent on DNN operations. And so we also look at using a much smaller neural network based on ResNet 9, where we take ResNet 18, chop out half the blocks, and then some little additional optimizations in there too. And that gives us a 100x speed up. So I kind of see batch rendering in physics as the future of fast simulation. I think that that is where we're going. However, we're still a ways off from these not being bespoke one-offs. And that's, and that's due to the realities of doing this. This is quite tricky. You end up implementing these things purely in C++. However, I think that there's research to be done and a interesting direction to go of looking at like JIT compiling Python into something like this and running it with C++ style parallelism, uh, domain specific languages and such. So I'll transition back to my summary slide and that's all I got for you guys. Thank you very much.